Okay, right, so today's session um, is about criminology and the uh, power of the image. Um, what I want to do today is try to explain the importance of the image when it comes to studying crime today, uh, and also um, to discuss um, your manner, your ways of uh, evaluating the subject. Um, okay, so um, like I say, these are the two things uh, that we're going to do. I think they're both as important as each other. Um, and uh, like I say, hopefully you know you'll get something out of it, and that's uh, what we're trying to do. Now, when we're looking at the power of the image, first of all, um, we'd like to introduce you to a term called visual criminology, um, which is a school of thought that has been developed in recent years by people who um, study crime from a cultural perspective. So, visual criminology has emerged out of uh, the background of cultural criminology, and one of the kind of interesting statements that they've made is that images of crime these days are as real, in inverted commas, as crime and criminal justice itself. Now, if you think of the kind of images that you'll see today uh, of crime, of things like happy slapping, fight club style videos, prison guards filming their abuse of their prisoners, um, CCTV footage, all the different television programmes that you've seen, cops with cameras, police camera action, all those different types of programmes. Um, people's experiences of crime often are based on the images that they see of it. So that's the kind of point why we're saying that images of crime are as real as crime itself, because this is where people get their knowledge of crime from. So, when we're talking about images of crime, perhaps one of the most famous images that people are aware of is this image. The image of um, Myra, Huntley, uh, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady um, is an image, as I say, that is well known. Now, most people might be familiar with this image, even though the crime that these two, uh, two people were responsible for happened in the 1960s, probably happened way before anybody started getting interested in crime, but for some reason, this image has seeped into the common consciousness. Now, if you have seen this image before, I would have a reasonable kind of estimate that you might have seen that part of the image. In other words, Myra Hindley's image tends to be the sort of the epitome of crime, the epitome of evil. Now, you should think about uh, Myra Hindley's role in the actual crime that she was actually charged with and ask yourself the question, why? Why is that image seen as sort of the image that sums up crime? Okay, and obviously then think about you know, sort of like, like I said before, her role in the crime as compared to uh, the role of, um, of Ian Brady. Like I say, that is an image that most people are, are familiar with. Um, I certainly was aware of it uh, at a very early age. Uh, I don't know where, I don't know why. I don't know if it was going to say Madame Two Swords or I was sort of, it was on television or it was a pop album cover or something like that. I don't know why, but I do know that that image of Myra Hindley was in my, in my mind long before I was interested in, in crime. Um, and I knew there was something wrong with it as well. Didn't quite know what it was, didn't know whether it was the bleached blonde hair, didn't know whether it was a kind of like the sturdy eyes that you get in the mugshot, you know, um, I don't know. But I do know that as a young child, to me that was an image of evil. And I was brought up to believe that that was an image of evil. Now, something in a more recent type of uh, example was uh, the case involving Maxine Carr. Now, um, as I'm sure you know, uh, in December 2003, Maxine Carr was found not guilty of two counts of assisting an offender. Actually, I say, you know, I'll show you. That part of, uh, sort of Maxine Carr's trial is often forgotten about. But she was actually found not guilty of, of, of two offences, but was found guilty of conspiring to pervert the course of justice. What I dare say you probably don't know about is even though you've got this awareness of Maxine Carr and the fact that she covered for her partner, for uh, Ian Huntley, involved in the, uh, in the murder investigation, was uh, a case a few years ago involving Carol Morris. Now, Carol Morris, uh, as it says there, eventually admitted to the police that she'd given them false alibis to protect her husband. Her husband was a prime suspect in the murder of Christine Darby, but uh, Carol Morris gave, like I say, false alibis. Very similar kind of behaviour to what Maxine Carr did. Now, in 2005, Maxine Carr had to be given lifelong anonymity from the High Court to protect her life. Okay? 
She was the first person uh, in, in, in English law who's not been, acute, not been convicted of murder to have been uh, granted one of these uh, an uh, anonymous orders. The other three people are uh, John Thompson, Robert Venables and Mary Bell. So Maxine Carr has, has, to, has to have had this order, but her crime, as it, as it says there, was conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Very different to the three people that have committed serious murders. Now, my point is, and the point that we'd like to kind of like get you to think about today, is, well, what about Carol Morris? Carol Morris uh, has already got an anonymity, anonymity, because she's not even, you know, in the, in the kind of common consciousness. So, um, the question that we want to ask is why? Why have we all heard of Maxine Carr? Why have we not heard about Carol Morris? Now, things I'd like you to think about. In the lead up to the trial, uh, Huntley and Carr uh, received extensive press coverage. Um, as it says there, research from Jones and Wardle illustrates the amount of coverage that these two people received. As it says there, that they investigated the reports from the Sun, the Daily Mail and the Times, okay, in the months leading up to the trial. And as it says there, the Times found that the image, uh, sorry, the overall thing was 124 times Huntley's image appeared in these newspapers, Maxine's car was 104. Now, Huntley was charged with two counts of murder, Maxine Carr was charged with uh, conspiring to pervert the course of justice. So, even though there's a massive distinction in the crimes that they're charged with, they seem to receive equal treatment uh, in, in the build-up to the trial. In fact, as it says there, the Daily Mail and the Times had more images of Maxine Carr than they did of the suspected murderer, Ian Huntley. So again, this is something that you need to think about. Why were the newspapers concentrating so much on the role of Maxine Carr, who was charged with a very different crime than what Ian Huntley was? However, it gets more uh, interesting in the sense that for the, all of these, for the whole sample of the newspapers that, that were researched, the average size of Carr's images were 21 centimetres squared larger than that of Ian Huntley. So not only did Maxine's car photographs appear almost as often as Ian Huntley's, her photographs were larger than that of the guy charged with the, uh, with the serious crimes of the double murder. So an interesting kind of look at sort of, you know, how the press represent crime, uh, how the press try to explain crime. Now, this um, headline, as it, as it says there, was uh, in the Sun on November the 5th, 2003, and was positioned next to two equally sized photographs of the accused. No emotion, no sympathy. And then the two photographs, and then a list of the charges that the two people were accused of. Okay? Now, the headline and photographs reinforce each other. Because you see the headline, you see the photographs. If you ask yourself the question, well, who's got no emotion? Who's got no sympathy? Well, it has to be Maxine Carr and Ian Huntley. It has to be, because you've got their photographs and you've got this headline, no emotion, no sympathy. So if you're reading that newspaper that day, you see that headline in the sun, you then are inclined to believe that both of these people had no emotion and no sympathy. It is fitting the kind of the monster caricature that newspapers use to try to explain these tragic type of events. So no emotion, no sympathy, two equally sized photographs next to the headline. However, the actual statement of no emotion, no sympathy was actually said by the judge in the case and it was his instruction to the jury. Basically saying, members of the jury, when you decide in the case, you mustn't use emotion, you mustn't use sympathy. Now, unless you know people read the whole story and got to sort towards the end of the report that said, well, this was actually a remark made by the judge, People are still going to be in this mode of thinking, thinking, well, these two people, I can see them, the photographs are there, the message above said they've got no emotion, they've got no sympathy. This can then possibly explain why people have had the reaction to Maxine Carr uh, that, that we possibly have, because she had no emotion and no sympathy, but she didn't. It was the judge that said that, and he said it to the jury, so, like I say, they would decide the case uh, you know, on, on, it, on its merits. Now... <coughs> 
This kind of thing, the kind of, you know, the, the, so I say, the power of the image, the fact that Maxine's car image, you know, was larger than that of Huntley's, the fact that it, say, it appeared almost as many times, even though she wasn't charged with murder, could explain, you know, why the public have had such uh, a, a reaction to her. And they didn't to Carol Morris. You know, Carol Morris, like I say, you know, you know, her kind of treatment, her life, you know, hasn't been affected in the same way that Maxine, Maxine Carr's had. Now, like I said, the power of the image in that sense seems to be very powerful. Yeah, well, you've got the image of Myra Hindley, the kind of the bleached blonde hair, the sturdy eyes, you know, the kind of the evil monster woman, which is, you know, how we explain female offended. Um, but you've also got, like I say, you know, the interplay between words and, uh, and image. Now, normally, words are what we uh, try to sort of investigate on our courses. Um, now, you know, these kind of words are, you know, uh, have, have meaning as well. Now, like I say, if we were doing a seminar, I, I, would, I would sort of like us to sort of investigate this kind of question, saying, you know, if you've got sort of an instruction saying, don't come too late, what would you do? Now, this is a story that, you know, I, I was told many years ago, um, and it was basically, I don't know how true it is, but it doesn't matter, it's a, a nice story, of um, a guy who was uh, one of the flying doctors in Australia. And uh, basically, he gets a telegram, and on the telegram, uh, the message is, don't come too late. The doctor picks up the telegram, reads this, thinks, right, what do I do? Don't come too late. Does that mean, don't bother coming, it's too late? Or does it mean, get here early, don't come too late? We don't know. Yeah, Words have got levels of meaning in the same way that images have got levels of meaning. Now, normally on our courses, we would concentrate on the levels of meaning in the written word. You know, it's important to recognise that words can be read in different ways. There is not an absolute meaning to, you know, a, a variety of words. So, like I say, you know, an ambiguous kind of state, statement there, which has got different, different levels of meaning.